Stay there in Proverbs chapter number three, but I'm going to take my title from a verse in Genesis 24, verse 27, where the Bible reads, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. The title of my sermon this morning is, I being in the way, the Lord led me. I being in the way, the Lord led me. And when we talk about God leading us, we, we all want God to lead us. We want God to show us what he wants for our lives. We want to know what the right decision to make is in any situation. And people often talk about God leading them or desiring for God to lead them or wanting to know what God's will is so that they can take the right path in life. Who are they going to marry? Where are they going to live? What are they going to do with their life? And the Bible says 24, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Go down to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, famous verse. In fact, it's, it's painted on the wall behind me here. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now, the Bible does not say that God is directing everyone's path. And this is where the Calvinists get it wrong. Where they think God's leading everybody and God's directing everybody and God's controlling everything. And everything is happening according to God's will. That is false because God's will is that all men would be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we certainly don't see that happening. God will only direct our paths if we trust in him with all of our heart then he will direct our paths. If we acknowledge him in all our ways, then he will direct our paths. And if we are in the way that God wants us to be, he will lead us. That's why he said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Now let's back up and get the context here of what does it mean to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and in all thy ways to acknowledge him. Because those are the prerequisites to God directing your paths. Go back to Proverbs 3, verse 1. The Bible says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. And of course, those are all things that all of us would like to have. Verse 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. So when he talks about our own understanding in verse 5, that's contrasted with the good understanding of verse 4 that comes from the truth of God's word, that comes from his commandments, that comes from God's law. See, that's where we get good understanding from reading the Bible, from getting God's commandments and God's laws and walking in those ways, then the Bible says, lean on that, trust that. Don't trust in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. What's being taught here is that if we read the Bible, study the Bible, learn the Bible, and then we strive to obey God's word in our lives, not to do things our way, but to do things his way, God will direct our paths. God will lead us. So you say, well, is the Bible have all the answers for my life? Is it going to tell me every decision that I need to make? It's not going to spell out specifically what to do in every situation. But if we follow what the Bible says, he will direct our paths and guide our decisions and make sure that we end up where he wants us to be. Look at Psalm 37. Just back up a little bit from Proverbs to the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. The Bible reads, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And again, I want you to pay close attention here that it does not say the steps of everyone are ordered by the Lord. It says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You know what that means? If you focus on just becoming a good man, if you focus on becoming a good woman, then God's will is going to reveal itself to you. You just go through life being good, obeying the Bible, learning the word of God, leaning on that, not leaning on your own understanding, 
and God's going to lead you. God's going to direct you. And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Bible says in verse 24, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You see, there are those who are forsaken, and there are those whose seed begs bread, but it's not the righteous. The Bible says, I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You see, a lot of people will just try to claim all the promises of the Bible for themselves, no matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what their relationship with God's law and God's commandments is, they just say, well, you know, God's going to guide me. God's going to take care of me. God's going to lead me. No, no, you have to do your part here. You have to be that good man. You have to get righteous. You need to get in God's law and get in God's commandments and meditate upon these things and do them and acknowledge him in all your ways. Then these promises are opened up to you that he'll direct your paths. He'll order your steps. He'll guide you. If you're in the way, then the Lord will lead you. You turn aside and go out of the way, you are no longer being led by God, and it's a jungle out there. Now, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and if you would turn there, this is a very famous scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, I'll read it while you're getting there. And we know that all things work together for good, period. Nope, that's not where it ends. But that's the way a lot of people's mentality is. Just all things work together for good. Everything happens for a reason. All things, but no, no, no. It says all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, those who don't have their own purpose of just getting what they want out of life and just living life to please and gratify themselves, People who are actually interested in serving God and doing what he wants with their life and getting involved in his purpose, his goals, his mission. The Bible says that those who are called according to his purpose and those that love him, the Bible says, all things work together for good to them. Now, that's a great promise to know that even when bad things in your life happen, it's for good ultimately. But not everyone can claim that promise. You have to love God. You have to be called according to his purpose. If you're not on his program, if you're not doing his work, if you're not interested in what he wants, then all things in your life are not going to work together for good. Some things are just going to be bad upon bad and more bad. So we have to get the context of these promises. Now let's back up to Romans 8 verse 18. Let's get a little more context on Romans 8.28. Go to Romans 8.18. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So right away, the context here is for people who are going through the trials and the tribulations and sufferings of a servant of God. They're not just living a lavish life of luxury and just enjoying all everything that the world has to offer and living a life on easy street. These are people that are suffering with him that they might also reign with him. These are people who choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So he says that the sufferings of this time, this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Look at Romans 8 verse 26. The Bible says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Our infirmities are our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So what we see is that Even if we're godly people, even if we're those who love God and we're the called according to his purpose and we love his law, we love his commandments, we're following those things, we're acknowledging those things, we don't always know where life is going to take us. A lot of times we make plans and have ideas and they don't work out. They fall through. 
And if we were to think about where we are right now in our life, perhaps, and, and, and think to ourselves that five years ago, we never thought we'd be at this point. And, and certain twists and turns come at us in life that we don't expect. I mean, we can't plan the next five years, the next 10 years, 15. We know not what shall be on the morrow. And I've made all kinds of plans and had all kinds of strategies and laid things out. And then it all just comes crashing down. It all gets canceled. It all fails. None of it works out. That happens all the time. Why? Because we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. No matter how good or righteous or godly or spiritual you are, you don't know the future. And I don't know the future. We don't know what God has planned for our lives. So all we can do is just do what's right, be good, be righteous, acknowledge him, read his word, just take sort of the next step that we see, let God's word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and trust that God's leading us. Because we're never going to see the big picture until it's all done and we look back and say, oh wow, that all worked together for good. That all worked out great. But there are going to be a lot of twists and turns through the way that we did not expect. That's why the Bible says we don't even know how we should pray as we ought. When we pray to God, oh God, do this, do that, God knows what's going to happen in the future. He knows the end from the beginning. And so a lot of the things that we're asking for are the wrong things or they're irrelevant things, things that aren't going to matter a year from now, five years from now, because we don't know the events that are going to happen. So the Bible is saying we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit steps in and makes intercession for us according to the will of God, the Bible says at the end of verse 27. He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Then the Bible says in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now the thought continues on. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God foreknows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. And he foreknew who would be saved and who would not be saved. So those that he foreknew, meaning, you know, thousands of years ago, all the way back from eternity past, God knew that, for example, Stephen Anderson would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a six-year-old boy and that I was going to grow up and become a pastor and God knew when you were going to get saved and, and what you're going to do. And he knows your whole life story He foreknew that, and he foreknew which people would be saved and which people would be damned. That does not mean he controls which people are saved and which people are damned. That's, again, where the Calvinists lack understanding. They think, oh, God determines it. No, no, it's whosoever will may take of the water of life freely. He died for all. He's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe, meaning he's even the Savior of those who don't believe. But the word preached does not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So God has foreknown which people would be saved. And God has decided in the past that the destiny of those who are saved is that they would be conformed to the image of his son. So the Bible says whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. This is where we get our word destiny. He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So God foreknew that those of us who are saved would be saved. And then he predestinated us that are saved that we would be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. But remember, this is according to his foreknowledge. And the Bible says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, Who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, 
in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So what is the promise of Romans 8, 28, when he says that all things will work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose? It's not a promise that all things are going to work together for your good, meaning your beefed up bank account or your fancy house and fancy car or perfect life, perfect family, perfect health. That's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that you're still, even in the will of God, going to go through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. But the promise is that in all of those things, you will be more than a conqueror. It's not in vain when you go through trials, tribulations, famines, perils, sword. It's all going to work together for good because God is using those things to conform you to the image of his son and you are going to win the victory. You are going to conquer. What does that mean to conquer? To have a great lifestyle of, of cars and houses and boats and RVs? No, no, no. You're going to accomplish great things for the Lord. You say, well, what, what, what do I need that for? I want God to bless me. I want stuff. I want comfort. I want fun. I want luxury. But then you're not even the call according to his purpose then. You don't even love God then because the Bible says that if you love the world and the things of this world, then the love of the Father is not in you. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of this world. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of uh, the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, if you actually are on God's program, if you actually are called according to his purpose, you can confidently take the next step and the next step and the next step forward, marching on, serving God, doing works for him, knowing that it's all going to work out for the best going to work out for your best because you're going to be a better person. You're going to be conformed to the image of God's son and you're going to do great works for God. You're going to be more than a conqueror. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be a conqueror. I don't want to be a loser. What's the opposite of a conqueror? A loser. I want to be a winner. I don't want to lose. Well, winning, Conquering is done through serving Christ. It's not through gratifying self and gratifying the flesh. That's how you become a loser. You want to become a, a loser really fast? Sit around and eat junk food and don't work and call in sick and fool around and just enjoy pleasure and relax and chill out. Don't do any work. Don't push yourself. I mean, that's, if we saw a person who lived that way, we would call them a loser. So we need to understand that conquering, winning, is not about just how much money we can get or how comfortable we can get or how little work we can do, how we can get our work week down from 40 hours to 35. Winning, no, wrong. That's not winning. You know, conquering or winning implies a battle. It implies a struggle. I mean, you don't just conquer without doing anything. You have to march forward. You have to have bold plans. You have to do work. You have to suffer and endure and march and fight and endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But you're a conqueror. And it feels good to be a conqueror. And you have purpose and meaning in your life. Conquering, not under your own banner, not under your own flag, but under Christ's flag. You're conquering for his kingdom, for his glory, for his benefit. And so that's what this scripture is actually teaching. So when it comes to the will of God, first of all, we have to examine our own heart and ask ourselves, what is our motive in life? Why are we here in life? Are we here in life just because the one with the most toys wins and we just gratify ourselves? Or are we here in life to please the Lord, to serve God, to serve Christ? And once we get that settled, that our life is about doing his work, then we need to just do what he told us to do, obey the commandments, and don't let it bother you that you don't know what the future holds or don't see the whole picture. We don't need to know. All we need to know is the next step. And God will always reveal that to us. And even when we don't know the next step, and let's say we're going down the path of life, 
and we get to a, a, a fork in the road and we don't know, should we turn to the right hand or turn to the left? We don't know, do we? You've probably come to decisions like that where, what do I do? Well, when you come to that point where there's that fork in the road, if you love God, if you're the call according to his purpose, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and you just pick one, it will always be the right one because that's the promise of God. Because he promised that he'll direct your paths. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So if I'm a good man and I'm walking down the road and I love God, I'm called according to his purpose, I'm reading the commandments, I want to obey, I want to do what's right, and I come to the fork in the road and I don't know whether I should go to the right or the left, I'm not going to hear an audible voice from God saying, go right. But what is going to happen is that I'm just going to walk up and say, you know what, I don't know where to go, but I'm just going to go to the right. And it'll always be the right decision, always. Why? Because what, God's going to direct you and lead you and guide you. If you do everything that you know to do, he'll guide you through the unknown. And I can think of so many times in my life that this happened. For example, when I came to Phoenix to start a church here, how did I know that this is the right place? And a lot of people, they become paralyzed and don't serve God because they don't know everything. And they don't know all the answers. So they don't know, well, where does God want me to go? What does God want me to do? And they just freeze. And then they make no decision. And then they're just stuck in a holding pattern because they're just like, oh, I'm, just, I'm just seeking God's will. I just don't know what to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. I can't decide. You know, it's sort of like when you go to a restaurant and, and you know, enough said. <laughs> Women can't decide, okay? I, there, I said it. My wife downloads the menu to her phone on the way to the restaurant. I'm thinking like, oh, great. She's going to, you know, she's studying the menu. That means when we get there, she's going to know what to order. No, no, she doesn't. I don't know, I don't know, Right? But here's the thing, it can be paralyzing because then, then you tell the waitress, hey, we need a little more time. You don't see the waitress again for 10 minutes. <laughs> see, when I was a kid, I remember my dad always saying, hey, you better have your ducks in a row because when that waitress comes, we need to order because we don't know when she's coming back. You don't want to wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, you never, I mean, you got to strike while the iron's hot. So, you know, this indecision can paralyze you where you don't, you, you don't order anything. And then the waitress is just going to move on to the next person and serve them. And you're left out in the cold for another 15 minutes. <laughs> But the point is that people often get too hung up on the where of God's will. And I, I like the saying that says the what of God's will is more important than the where of God's will. The what is more important than the where. You say, how did you know that your wife was the right person to marry? How did you know that you were supposed to start a church in Phoenix? How did you know that Tempe was the place to put it in, you know, of all places to put it in Phoenix? Why Tempe? How did you know? The, the truth of the matter is, I didn't know. I did not know. But I was obeying the Bible. I was doing the stuff that I did know. You know, I know I'm supposed to go to church. I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. I know I'm supposed to keep these commandments. I know I'm supposed to be soul winning. And then I just did as occasion served me. I just made decisions. But then as I look back over those decisions, I can honestly say, as the song says, Jesus led me all the way. Even though I didn't understand it at the time. See, we just need to do what we know to do. See, the Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's not a sin if you don't do stuff you didn't even know about. Now, I'm not talking about Uh, obviously violating laws you didn't know about. You're supposed to know these laws. But I'm saying that God will reveal the works that he wants us to do in our life. And we need to do those things as they come along. So, you know, when it came to coming to Phoenix, I just decided to come to Phoenix for the very spiritual reason that I hate cold weather. I love palm trees. I love the desert. I like being warm. And I think Phoenix is a, is a beautiful place. And you say, well, oh, you carnal. But, but here's the thing. There is no verse in the Bible that told me which city to go to to start a church. 
So I picked the one that I liked. I knew I wanted to come to this region. And then there was a, there was a guy at the, I was at Hiles Anderson College, and there was a guy at the college who uh, would sort of help you pick where to go start a church, or, or, or he would help you get hired to take over a church. And I knew that I wanted to start a church. So I went to him, and I had a list of, of five cities that were in this region. And I just prayed to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I don't really care which one of these I go to. These all look great to me. If you have a preference, then reveal it to this guy, because I'm going to go ask this guy, and whatever, wherever he says to go, I'm just going to go there. You know, and I walked in, and I had a list of some, some cities in this warm region of the southwest United States, and he, he pointed me to Phoenix. And he said, you know, I think Phoenix is the best place on your list. I said, okay, Phoenix it is. I came here. I love it. When I landed uh, on the plane, when I, when I flew here just to sort of check things out, I went up to the rental car counter, and the, the, the girl at the rental car counter, I, just, I told her, I said, hey, I'm going to start a church in, in the Phoenix area. Which part of Phoenix should I start it in? And she said, Tempe. And I just said, okay. And, that's, and I drove, so I got in the car. I drove over here. Tempe looked good. Let's do it. You say, well, what in the world? You're just living life like just reckless. But the thing is, though, that as I look back, it all worked out perfectly, even down to the subdivision that I lived in. Think about how many times you've gone soul winning in a subdivision in Tempe and had nobody get saved. Or even if you maybe had a couple people saved in an entire subdivision, none of them came to church, did they? But yet the exact neighborhood that I lived in Several people came to church right out of that subdivision. Some of them even still go to this church to this day. So obviously, even though I just bought that house because the house looked like the right house to start a church in, it, fed, it, it, it met our needs at the time. It was what we were looking for. Just God obviously put me in that neighborhood because he knew that some of the first church members were going to come from that neighborhood. You know, Amanda, that's still here, she came on the second Sunday from soul winning in that first neighborhood, the Skaggs family, and a bunch of other people who lived in that neighborhood and came to our church and were some of the early church members. Some of them are still here. Some of them are no longer here. But the point is, I was able to get the church started in that subdivision. God had some people in that subdivision that were prepared to be the first church members. Because what if I would have been living in a subdivision, because I started the church out of my house and I radiated out from there with my soul winning, what if I would have been put in a subdivision where there was nobody who had any interest in, in, in being a part of the church or serving God? That would have been pretty depressing, wouldn't it, the first few months? But thank God he had planted people all over that subdivision that were going to receive Christ as Savior, that were going to join the church and everything like that. I couldn't have planned that, but God just worked it out that way. Now, that's an example of things working out good, but a lot of things work out badly, and we don't understand why, but then looking back, there's a reason why. It always ends up working out for good. Go, if you would, to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter number 50. I remember when I got married, you know, anytime anybody gets married, they, you know, it's a, it's a very serious decision. They put a lot of thought into that decision. It's very important. And in fact, the, the, the very scripture that I took the title from the sermon, I being in the way the Lord led me, is about a guy who's looking for a wife. You know, he ends up finding Rebecca for Isaac. And I remember that I wondered, you know, I don't know, am I doing the right thing? Everybody feels that way probably when you're getting married because it's just such an important life-changing decision. But I remember just thinking to myself, you know what? I'm living for God. I'm going soul winning. I met my wife while out soul winning. And so I believe that this is who God has led me to. Now, looking back, it's worked out great. Nine children later and, and, you know, here we are happily ever after. But at the time, you don't know how it's going to work out. So the point is, especially if you're a young single person, you better get in the will of God. 
You better start acknowledging God in all your ways. You better start keeping God's commandments. You better make sure you're the called according to his purpose because one of the worst things you could do in life is to get married to somebody who's an unbeliever or get married to somebody who's going to be a, a burden to you and a pain in the neck to you and somebody who's going to drag you down. I mean, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a, a brawling woman in a wide house. I mean, if you're a young single man, if you're a young single girl, you better make sure you're living in the will of God because you want God to lead you through that decision. You want to have the assurance when you get married that God's leading me, God's directing me. How are you going to know? Well, take a look in the mirror and ask yourself how much you're living for God, how much you love him, how much you want to work for him and serve him. Because there are a lot of people who'd be doing a lot more for God if they hadn't have married somebody that was the wrong type of person for the works that God had for them because they get out of the will of God. Now look, I don't want you to think that we have to be perfect and if we're not perfect, we're going to step out of God's will and then our whole life is just going to be on the wrong path forever because thank God he's constantly adjusting his will for our lives. What you'll often hear preachers refer to as the permissive will of God. You know, there's the perfect will of God and then there's the permissive will of God. Even if we make a mistake, it's sort of like when you're driving around and you've got a GPS unit and you turn the wrong way. What does it do? It recalculates. God will do that for you. God will recalculate the route. You know, some of you, it's just, he's constantly having to recalculate, recalculating, recalculate, you know, and he keeps telling you, make a U-turn, make a U-turn if possible, make a U-turn. That's what God's trying to say to you, make a U-turn, which is, you know, repent. You're going the wrong way. This is not getting you anywhere near the destination. But here's the thing, no matter how far you get off track, once you start actually following the instructions that the GPS is getting you, you're heading toward where you need to be at that point. So it's never too late to start listening to the voice of that GPS and getting closer to the destination. You know, it's never too late to obey the instructions. God will recalculate the route. Now, it's going to add a few hours to the route. It could add miles and detours and, and so forth, but you're still going to be able to get there. So this isn't a doom message of, you married the wrong person. You moved to the wrong city. You got the wrong job. It's, you know, no, no, because at this point, you can still get on the right program, and God can work things out for you. And he can even take some of your past mess-ups, and actually he can even incorporate those into his new plan and use those things for good. He's constantly recalculating. But if you're constantly not listening, it doesn't matter how perfect of a route he recalculates you know he can recalculate a route that's only like an it's only adding one mile but if you then turn right when he says to turn left again now you've added five miles you know you might add 15 miles think about sometimes you make a mistake on the freeway out in the middle of nowhere the next exit's 25 miles down the road you miss one exit it's 50 miles then you have to look for those signs that say no U-turn because those are usually the best place to, to do a U-turn. No, I'm just, just kidding. I didn't say that. So anyway, Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, the Bible says, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not, I'll nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now, notice what he says here. As for you, verse 20, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. He doesn't say God meant it unto good because he really wanted me to live my best life now. And so God just gave me a great 13 years. It's been, man, it's been an awesome 20 years. It's been an awesome 13. That's not what he's saying. He said, that God meant it unto good to save much people alive. So God's good of all things working together for good, or they meant it for evil, and God meant it for good, is always about saving people alive. It's about helping people. It's about winning people to Christ. It's about God's work and God's kingdom going forward. Now, in the process, he'll take care of us in the process. He will meet our needs. 
he will give us what we need. Go to Matthew chapter 6. But at the end of the day, it's not really all about us. The Bible does say that if we trust in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. Meaning that we're going to enjoy the journey of serving God. We're going to enjoy being a conqueror. We're going to enjoy going on all the adventures that God has for us. Even though there will be hard times and trials and tribulations, there's joy in serving God. And he does bless us. And he gives us all kinds of benefits. The Bible says he daily loads us with benefits. Daily. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that the final destination is not our happiness. The final destination is God's work getting done. Now, if you get on that GPS coordinate of getting God's work done, getting lots of people saved, doing the will of God, there are going to be all kinds of little pit stops along that route for your benefit. There will be stops at Round Table Pizza. There will be stops at, at, at Dateland to get a milkshake. There will be fun, scenic little vista points where you can pull out and look at the beautiful scenery. There will be little roadside attractions and, and, and meals and, and, and drink stops and, and a bag of chips from the gas station and a, you know, and a candy bar from the gas station. But that's not what it's about. It's not about chips. It's not about ice cream. It's not about pizza. It's not about a milkshake. It's about getting God's work done. That's what life is about. And once you understand that, you get on God's program and you set your face toward his goals and his program and what he wants to do, you'll find him showing you things and giving you things that you never would have dreamed of and you'll find yourself enjoying life and enjoying all the benefits that he loads us with. But if you go out seeking to enjoy, you're not going to enjoy because it's an illusion, it's a mirage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Actually, let's just jump down. We don't need to read the whole thing. Let's just jump down to verse 31, Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What does it mean, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof? He's saying, you have enough problems to deal with today. Don't stress about tomorrow or next week or next month. The, the evil of today is sufficient for you. Just deal with what you're doing today, and God will guide your steps, guide your path, take care of you. But notice he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So into the GPS of life, you type in, hey, soul winning, serving God, loving God, following his plan, his purpose, his route. And then I remember I used to have a TomTom -tom GPS. And I remember the TomTom, -tom, I'd be driving down the road and every once in a while it would, it would tell me, about, oh, you know what, now I remember. You told it what you wanted it to warn you about. So you could basically type in, tell me every time there's an In-N-Out burger. Seriously. In the TomTom, -tom, you would tell it, notify me every time there's an In-N-Out burger. So you're driving down the road, driving, it's like, bloop, bloop, bloop. And it would show you, hey, there's an In-N-Out burger a couple miles this way. And it would show you where you were in relation to it. But you could type in anything, whatever you're looking for. If you're looking for a park, if you're looking for food, if you're looking for a rest area, I would tell it, hey, notify me about rest areas because, uh, you know, you might just be zoned out and you're not paying attention. You might miss the rest area or notify me if there's a gas station and it will tell you, well, this is the way life is. You seek first the kingdom of God. You type into the GPS of life that you want to go where he wants you to go. And then along the way, he'll show you other cool things along the route that are for your benefit, for your comfort, for your enjoyment as you go. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He knows that you need to eat. He knows that you need to drink. He knows that you need some enjoyment and refreshment and relaxation in your life. He knows that you need to sleep. He knows that you need a bed to sleep in. He'll take care of all that. But you've got to get on his program and want to serve him. 
and he will direct your path and direct your steps. You know, I was thinking about this. God meant it for good. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I was thinking about this in relation to our missions trip to Botswana last year. And you want to talk about planning for things to go one way and then they go a totally different way? I, that's not what we planned. You know, we had this plan in our mind of we're going to go to Botswana, we're going to start a church there, Garrett's going to live there for the rest of his life. Well, he didn't live there for the rest of his life. But that, you know, going into it, we had the right motives. We were on God's program. We wanted to win souls. We wanted to serve him. We were a call, called according to his purpose. We weren't there for our health. We were there because we wanted to do something for him. We were obeying his directive to go preach in all nations and teach all nations and so forth. So we had it in our mind a certain way how this thing's going to go. And, we, you know, we're going to plant this church. And Garrett was even talking about his five-year plan, his 10-year plan, 20-year plan. I mean, he's laying it all out. We had it all figured out, didn't we? We printed up these giant custom maps because over there, they don't know from maps. They, they do everything in directions. Go up there, turn right, turn left. We're like, you have a map? We don't use maps. So we, we made these custom maps of Haberoni and Slokwang in Botswana, and we we're going to use these maps, and we we're just like we have back there for Phoenix. We we're going to do the same thing over there. We had the maps printed. You know, those maps are, are rolled up in an office somewhere. They're not being used. Why? Because things didn't go according to plan. But I was just stopping and thinking about yesterday the repercussions of that plan going awry. Now, obviously, the people that kicked us out of the country, the government, they meant it for evil. They're wicked people. They don't want the word of God to be preached. They don't want salvation to be preached. The rumor has it that the, that the president of Botswana is a sodomite, and that's why he hated us, because he personally ordered us to be thrown out of the country. He, the president of Botswana was listening to the radio while I was on that radio interview, and he personally ordered me to be arrested and deported, and then Garrett was arrested and deported a couple days later. And you say, well, how is that good? Well, there is so much good that came of it because of the fact that, first of all, number one, after we were thrown out, we were on the front page of every newspaper in, in Botswana and even other parts of Africa. So a lot of people started listening to the preaching. A lot of people got saved, learned about soul winning. I mean, we, 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 we actually had a major impact over there. Millions of people heard the word of God through that event. But even that aside... Getting thrown out of Botswana led to great works that we did in other places, namely in Guyana, amongst the American Indians, and now in Malawi. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, what, what's interesting is that right now, we're doing a great push to try to preach the gospel to all of the Indians in our whole state, all the 21 Indian reservations in Arizona. We want to knock every door And that's our big emphasis right now. That's our big push right now. And we've got all kinds of charts and binders and maps and, and we're making it happen, thank God. But why are we doing that? Well, that, that idea came about because we were kicked out of Botswana and we knew that it was going to be six months before Garrett went to Malawi. And so we had six months and we had Garrett. And I said, well, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we do some home missions? You know, if Garrett's a missionary... And he's kind of between mission fields, as it were. Let's do some home missions. And I thought, you know, the Native American reservations, these are, you know, another nation living amongst us. So we can go soul winning on the mission field right here in Arizona. We can step into their sovereign nation of the Apaches or the Navajos or the Hopis or the Pimas or wherever, and we can do some home missions. That whole idea came about because of being thrown out of Botswana. And then when we started doing it, at first it was a smaller goal of just, well, we're going to do all the little reservations, and then the big reservations we'll just do a few, a few soul winning trips and call it good. But then once we started doing it, we saw that it was so receptive and it was so white under harvest, we revised the goal to saying, let's knock every door 
of every Indian in this whole state of Arizona. That's a, that's a huge task. That's going to be a huge accomplishment if God allows us to get that done. That's going to be amazing. I, I, I think it's unparalleled. I've never heard of any other church even doing something like that where they, where they knock every door of all the Indians in the state. But then not only that, doing that has, has broadened my mind of just knocking every door of every person in the whole state because of the fact that we've already had the small town soul winning going since 2007. And then, you know, just it's just all kind of, now it's all starting to take shape. And I'm starting to see, now I see what God wants us to do. God wants us to reach our entire state with the gospel. And then he wants us to be able to tell other pastors and other churches, go and do likewise. And then all of America could be reached with the gospel. But we could set a pattern here by showing that it's not enough just to evangelize our zip code or just Tempe or just Phoenix. No, no, no. We've broadened our vision. God opened our mind to the fact that we need to reach these small towns, these Indian reservations. We need to finish the whole state and then other churches that are in Florida, Texas, California, Nevada, where they can get the same vision and the whole nation could hear the gospel as a result. But where did it come from? getting kicked out of Botswana because that's what even got us on this, this Indian kick and it's been great but not only that getting us kicked out of Botswana caused me to go online and start thinking about well what are the other Botswana type places that we haven't been banned from because we wanted to keep doing stuff in Botswana but we can't so it's like okay well where else can we go then our friend Brother Shane comes and shows up and says, oh, I got to go visit my aunt in Guyana, and she's having all these problems. And then I go on Wikipedia and type in Guyana, and I'm like, oh, this is close. This looks good. Then we go to Guyana, turn the place upside down. Look, we went to Guyana. We preached to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of high school students. We preached in like 20 schools of about 500 students each. Thousands of people saved through the works of Brother Garrett Kirschway, Brother Matthew Stuckey, Charlie Jeffrey, Lola was down. I mean, lots of people that have been down there working and winning souls down there. We shook that place up to the point where 108 Hindu temples in Guyana all joined together. 108 Hindu temples joined together and took out a full page ad in the biggest newspaper in the country condemning us condemning us. I mean, it was like in the book of Acts where, where all of the, the silversmiths, they all got together and said, hey, we got to stop the Christians from preaching because people are going to stop worshiping the goddess Diana. And then they start screaming, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Remember that story in the book of Acts? Look, these Hindu idol worshipers down in Guyana got so angry because we turned that place upside down. They took out a giant full page ad in the newspaper condemning us and then the government condemned us and everybody was just it was all over the news it was all over the papers every day for like two weeks straight people are people are sending me pictures cab drivers that we used were, were whatsapping me pictures of the newspaper hey you guys are in the paper you guys are in the paper I googled it I found like 20 newspaper articles about it and it was just we turned it upside down but we never would have even gone there if we hadn't gotten kicked out of of Botswana. See, it wasn't according to our plan, but God's got a program to save much people alive. And we just have to ride the roller coaster of God's plan and just see where it takes us. Just, just everywhere we go, win souls. Everywhere we go, preach the Bible. Everywhere we go, try to obey the Lord and just let God direct our paths. The geography doesn't matter. It's the what, not the where of God's will. Not only that, but in Malawi right now, it, it's hard for me to communicate with, with the people that are in Malawi right now. But we have a group of people in our church, from our church, that are in Malawi right now. And it's hard for me to communicate with them because they have such bad internet and phone reception that they're, they're kind of just out of radio contact. But we're getting little bits and pieces. I couldn't even believe this. They had a church service this morning in Malawi. They've only been there for like two weeks. They had a church service in Malawi with 220 people in it this morning in Malawi because it's nine hours later there, so this already happened. 
They had 220 people. They've only been there for a couple weeks. They got 220 people show up for church service. 20 people got baptized at the service, or 19 or whatever it was. I don't know the exact number. And then they've literally, because there's 30 people over there, about nine from our church, 21 people that, that are basically people who tune into the sermons from Faith Forward Baptist, but they live elsewhere. They got on board with the trip. There's like 30 people from our church over there right now. And in the past couple weeks, all together, they've had over 1,000 people saved. They've got 200 and some people showing up for a service. They're baptizing 19 people in one morning. I mean, what in the world? That's awesome. But, where, but you know what? I'd never even heard of Malawi until, you know, six months ago, I'd never even heard of Malawi. You know what made me hear of Malawi? Getting kicked out of Botswana. And then I start looking for other Botswana-esque places. And I saw Malawi. I said, wow, Malawi looks even better than Botswana. See, God will sometimes shut down your plans, but he's got a better plan for you. He's got a better. Maybe you had your heart set on, on you're going to marry this one person and then it falls through. And, oh, my, my life's over. I'm heartbroken. Maybe God's just got somebody better for you. God's got something better for you beyond that. And so we need to understand that the, the concern of our lives is not to map out our whole life, not to just know the future and know everything about what we need to do. It's just about taking the next step. It's about loving God. It's about being good. It's about obeying the commandments. It's about getting on God's program and just let God take you where he wants to take you. Because you're better off just trusting him, letting him take you wherever he wants to take you. In the end, you're going to be happier that way than to try to say, well, no, I want to go this way. I want to go here. I don't care what the GPS is telling me. This is a better route. It's more scenic, more roadside attractions, more, you know, more in and out Burger or whatever. No, no, no. Get on the direction. And look, he might take you through some desolate wilderness. You might see a sign that says next service is 70 miles. And you're thinking, I don't want to go this way. This is boring. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. Stick with it. And God's going to get you there. And there's a better meal. There's a restaurant waiting for you that you haven't even heard of. And it's better than In-N-Out Burger. It's better than. I know it's hard to imagine. No, I'm just kidding. So the, 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 the point is that God wants to direct our paths. And we should want God to direct our paths. We just need to trust him, acknowledge him, do right in the sight of God. Focus on what you do know and just do it. And I'm telling you, God's going to take you places that you never dreamed you would go. I've gone so many places that I never would have dreamed I would go. I've seen and experienced so many things that I never thought that I would. Because it's, it, it's a wild ride when you're serving the Lord. But you need to, to get on his program. And don't, don't get paralyzed by, I don't know what to do. Just pick something. Pick something, it's going to be good. Just pick. You say, oh, I want to start a church. You know, I just don't know where to go. Just pick one. You know, you know what our biggest problem right now with starting churches across America is? It's not figuring out where to start them. That's pretty easy to figure out. You know what, it, you know what the hard part is? Finding the guy who's qualified. Finding the guy who meets the biblical qualifications. That's the hard part. The hard part is not knowing the will of God understanding the will of God. No, the hard part is being a good man. Because if you're a good man, your steps will be ordered by the Lord. So you focus on being a good man, focus on being a good one. Who do I marry? Where do I live? What am I going to do for a living? Are you being a good man? Are you being a good woman? Look, if you're a good woman, if you're a good man, God will, like Isaac and Rebecca, he'll, he'll lead you to the right spouse. If you are in the way, God will lead you. Because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The right job. The right, look, I, I, I did fire alarm systems for years. I didn't, when I was a little kid, I didn't say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a low voltage electrician. <laughs> no kid says that. Well, how'd you get into that? How'd you know that God wanted you to get into that? I got into that because I needed a job 
and some random guy who hates my guts now because he hates the Lord and he hates church and hates preaching said, hey, I can get you a job at this alarm company. I said, okay, yeah, put in a word for me. He got me the job. He was a, he was a heathen, but he got me the job. But looking back, that job was perfect. All the jobs were perfect. Everything led me up to the point where I'm at right now. So just get on board and ride that train and see where it takes you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.